Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Donald Brady. I, I want to welcome you to the 2013 Fall Faculty Assembly. My Vanderbilt career started here as a naive freshman in 1982 when a couple of friends and I went to Chancellor Wyatt in his first year here and asked him to give us Old Science Hall uh, to create a TV studio. First week of freshman year, I asked the chancellor for a building. <laughs> Nick, I will not do that to you today. Uh, 31 years later, I'm a professor of medicine and chair of your faculty senate for, for the coming year. So I really, really do welcome you here and thank you for coming. We will get to meet old friends and hopefully make some new friends today. We'll get to honor faculty, hand out awards, and hear about some great accomplishments. We'll get to hear from one of our own about his impactful research he's doing around the globe and the truly global impact it is having on people's lives, and that will be outstanding. But most importantly, I hope we get to celebrate what is the opportunity we have as a group to come together, to influence lives, to help young people move forward, to discover new ideas, and truly influence where this world not just Nashville, Tennessee, or the US, but where the world is headed. Uh, and it is truly an amazing opportunity that we all have uh, to be together. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker uh, for today. Gregory Melkor Bars is a medical ethnomusicologist. Did I get that right, Greg? Okay, thank you. Who has engaged field research in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and South Africa for the past 20 years. He received his PhD from Brown University and his MA from the University of Chicago. He's Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology at Blair with secondary appointments in Anthropology and the Divinity School and serves this year as the Alexander Hurd Distinguished Professor at Vanderbilt. His latest book is a co-edited volume titled The Culture of AIDS in Africa, Hope and Healing in Music and in Arts published by Oxford University Press. In addition, he is co-editor of two editions of Shadows in the Field, New Perspectives for Fieldwork in Ethnomusicology. And if you keep making me say that word, I'm gonna trip on it in a minute. Also with Oxford. He is a Grammy-nominated professor and producer for his Smithsonian CD, Singing for Life, Songs of Hope, Healing, and HIV AIDS in Uganda. He is currently engaged in collaborative research regarding music and HIV AIDS in disenfranchised townships in South Africa. Affectionately known as P-Bars by his students, he serves as the faculty head of the North House in the Commons, a house that prides itself as being the reigning two-time Commons Cup champion. So Professor, I welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Dr. Brady. I begin by questioning the responsibilities the responsibilities that attend contemporary scholarship by highlighting the differences between what we have historically understood as the goals of scholarship and the responsibilities anticipated by those with whom we are privileged to work. The late Kirusu Thomas, Inanga player, the last living musician of the Tutsi royal court in Rwanda. Kirusu would not play for me what other researchers asked him to play due to the restrictions of my research clearance. Instead, he sang about unity and reconciliation, music he only sang for villagers in Rwanda. I'm 
I recently chaired a panel on music and nuclear disaster in which a scholar interrupted her paper on atomic bombing in the Marshall Islands, lowering her text on the results of exposure to radiation on the human singing voice to reflect on the responsibility she felt to use her field research, her musical recordings, to expose the atrocities of nuclear testing. I quote, that was the last time I heard that song in the Marshall Islands, and that was for my going away party sending me back to the United States, as the Rangalapese people knew that I would be sharing the message with people here, end quote. The insertion of social activism struck me as unique to the expected performance of a junior colleague's prescribed academic modality. I suspect that the title of my presentation, Re Responsibilities in the Academy, might make some a bit uncomfortable due to its prescriptive tone. Medical ethnomusicologists, nevertheless, now find themselves in a critical moment where boundaries surrounding the typical object of study musical sound have expanded wide enough to allow room for the researcher to effect change, to advocate for artists, and to meddle in the very musical styles and traditions we study. The role of musicians is changing and continues to adapt in the face of increasing healthcare crises in sub-Saharan Africa, as is the role of ethnomusicologists as they engage community responses to global health issues. Some in the academy might, find, uh, might feel uncomfortable with the consequence of responsibility, action, and by extension, advocacy, leading ultimately to activism. I have spent much time in the past few years considering an unlikely disciplinary position that challenges current thought in music scholarship, a type of ethnomusicology without borders approach to academic responsibility. Perhaps I am at heart questioning an inherited, inherited academic model, one in which my academic discipline begins with step one, field research, leading to documentation, further reflection, analysis, teaching, publications, and then action, but by others, by students, by readers of our research, and only at the end, action by the scholar herself. But what happens if action is foregrounded, repositioned in the prog progression of an epistemological process? Would results change? Would expectations change if action is repositioned in my own discipline? A book seems a good place to focus. The Culture of AIDS in Africa, a large-scale publication with Oxford University Press that documents the role of the arts throughout Africa in regards to HIV AIDS. Perhaps this should have been my last slide the culminating effort of a decade of collaborate effort with uh, healthcare professionals that led to the birthing of an academic field, medical ethnomusicology. But I jumped to the climax of the presentation to ask, what good can a book do? How is compiling a set of essays worth the effort when time could be better spent in the field, earning respect by doing? Such questions present a central tension within the Culture of AIDS in Africa book and of medical ethnomusicology more generally. For what, in fact, are we responsible as scholars of musical traditions? How do you express a scourge? This is the central question posed in the Culture of AIDS in Africa. The emergence of HIV AIDS in the world, and in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, forces us all to address this question. Yet, many authors contributing to this volume reinterpreted this central question, asking, how do you address a scourge? 
As with other health crises, global populations bring the expressive forms around them to bear on presenting the nature of AIDS in moral, social, local, medical, religious, and transnational terms. And those in the academy studying music as a medical intervention frequently find themselves in a position of both expressing and addressing the scourge. There's a persistent concern among ethnomusicologists with issues of ethics and advocacy and their relationship to field-based research, step one of knowledge acquisition in my discipline. This is not a foreign issue in the history of ethnomusicology. Today, some might consider it part of the description of what ethnomusicologists should engage, self-examination and self-criticism. My tongue is firmly planted in my cheek when I say that as a medical ethnomusicologist, I do not meddle, I do not mediate, I do not practice cultural activism, since if I do, it is surely accidental. I must ask, however, what's at stake in the academy and in the lives of the people with whom I work for repositioning action earlier in the field-based research model. At the root of my own work, which has been publicly labeled as extreme ethnomusicology, is a need to reevaluate our relationships in and out of the field. But let's get back to responsibility. In 1993, South African photographer Kevin Carter, a member of the infamous Bang Bang Club, traveled to southern Sudan as a photojournalist. While there, Carter took the now iconic photo of a vulture preying upon an emaciated Sudanese child. Carter said he waited, hoping the vulture would spread its wings for the perfect shot. It didn't, and he snapped the haunting photo before chasing the vulture away. Sold to the New York Times, the photograph was titled Metaphor for Africa's Despair, and it won a Pulitzer for Carter. As soon as the photograph was published, Carter became the focus of intense critique. Specifically, question was the responsibility of the photographer. Did Carter take his shot and leave the child to the vulture? Did he help the young girl? Carter admitted to walking away, not intervening, abandoning the child to her fate. Criticized internationally as the man who, with his camera, was as much a predator as the vulture, Carter committed suicide within three months of taking his most famous photograph, unable to reconcile the responsibilities of his profession and the responsibilities of being human. Boundaries in any discipline respond to a cultural crisis or to the needs of a research subject and must be constantly pushed and constantly questioned. I lived in Tanzania during the early 90s, and I remember the day in 1994 when the plane carrying the presidents of neighboring Rwanda and Burundi was shot down. Living through the gen genocide in Rwanda was a horrifying experience, and on my return to the States, I remember not feeling comfortable with my ability to integrate field experiences with the academy. At a conference shortly after the genocide, I sat next to a colleague who became distraught during a presentation about Africa, openly crying as she reflected on our responsibilities as scholars in regards to the atrocities of genocide. Shocked at the display of emotion, I know now that I had not yet fully realized my own potential as an ethnomusicologist. I was not able at that time to push my own boundaries, confirming for me now that medical ethnomusicology demands a willingness to feel openly and to emote deeply. And I find it embarrassing now that it took me 17 years to reconcile my experiences, my emotions, my abilities with my scholarship, my response, a documentary film about the role of music in reconciliation efforts in contemporary Rwanda.
A willingness to act, and to act very deeply, is at the heart of any extreme or responsible approach we adopt in our academic disciplines. And it is within our actions, our scholarship, that boundaries get pushed and remain permanently altered and moved. For many of us today, living our lives as extreme ethnomusicologists, as extreme academics, is the only normal we will ever know. And if any of us find that we have the ability to respond in our lives or in our research, then responsibility is perhaps redefining the academy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very, very much for uh, presenting that to us. And that is a very hard act to follow. Um, thank you so much. Let me see if I can work the computer here and find. OK, there we are. So I'd like to take the next few moments to actually talk about the responsibility uh, of your Faculty Senate. And to let you know a little bit more about the Faculty Senate for those of you who are not familiar with what the Senate does and how we need you as the general faculty to help the Senate move the university forward. So if you don't know, the Senate is actually composed of six, the Senate is composed of seven standing committees, the Executive Committee plus six subcommittees. And for the coming year, we've actually uh, tasked two task force for the year, one on online education and one on Greek life, to examine those two areas from the faculty perspective uh, this year. I'm very, very proud to say that we have a very diverse executive committee for the coming year. I want you to see who they are because I want you to connect with them now and throughout the year. If they're here, I would love them to stand uh, as their names are called. I'm serving as your chair and I'm from the School of Medicine. Your vice chair for the year is Jeff Johnston uh, from ANS in chemistry. He's over here. Your chair elect is Paul Lim from Divinity, right here in the middle. Uh, your vice chair elect is Rolanda Johnson from the School of Nursing, right here. Your immediate past chair, who so wonderfully led us last year, is Saul, Sal March from Owen. Over here, thanks, Sal. And your immediate past vice chair is Lillian Nanny from Medicine, who's finishing out the term term for Judy Ashner, who's moved on to New York. I also want you to know who the people leading your committees are, because the committees are really where the work of the Senate happens. We come together as a Senate regularly uh, to discuss issues, but a lot of the work, the day-to-day -day work throughout the years, done by the committees themselves. And again, if these people are here, also stand as I walk through uh, these committees. For strategic planning and academic freedom, it's Andy Gokley from Engineering. Andy's back here. Academic Policies and Services is being chaired by Agnes Fogo from Medicine, who I don't see here right now. Um, student Life, Joe Webby from Peabody. Uh, faculty Grievances, Eric Barth from School of Engineering. Uh, faculty Life, Chris Lynn from Medicine, right here. Senate Affairs, Ann Price from Medicine, right here in the middle. Uh, and the online educa education task force is being led by Ranga Ramanujan from Owen. Ranga, are you here? Ah, hi, Ranga. And then finally, the Greek Life Task Force is being led by David Weintraub and Greg Melkor Bars as co chairs uh, for the coming year. Hey, David, thank you. So, what do these committees, how do these committees know what to do during the year? It's a very collaborative process, and I would invite the faculty to help us develop the charges for the committees for the year. These are a sample of the charges for the committees this year across the board, not labeled any specific committee, but I want to give you a flavor of what the Senate does. We're not simply a reactionary body to things that happen. We want to help work and move the university forward to be your conduit with the administration. And notice I said with, not to, because it is really a hand-in-hand -hand effort between the administration of the school and the faculty, both the faculty senate as well as the general faculty. 
So I want to highlight a couple of things. One, communication, communication, communication. The executive committee has really wants to take on an effort for the coming year to make sure that we are doing a better job as a university, as a senate, as a faculty, in communicating vertically and horizontally about the issues that are important to you. If you haven't already seen it, your MyVU that came out today, how many people in the room read MyVU? That is a that's a great show of hands. Well, keep reading it. Uh, you're going to see regular updates from the Faculty Senate and what's going on in the Senate. There's a great article uh, today about what the Senate is looking forward to for the year. We also, uh, the bullet up here about maintaining relationships between Faculty Senate and University staff organizations. A University staff council came to the Senate last year and said, you know, we really want to look at the issue of access to lactation rooms for breastfeeding mothers across the campus. And we partnered as a Senate with uh, the University Staff Council to take the issue to the administration who gracefully worked with us uh, to make sure that within a 10 minute walk of anywhere on this campus, a breastfeeding mother can get to her room to do what she needs to do uh, to carry on for her child. And then also looking at the Greek system for the coming year from a very holistic perspective. What are the great things that the great Greek system at Vanderbilt does for the people who are in the Greek system? What are the ways that we can improve it and help it move forward uh, as the university evolves? So that's going to be a great effort there from David and Greg. And then finally for the Senate, we want to represent you well. We want to make sure that you know who we are and how you can access us. So what, what's in it for you as a general faculty? What does the Senate mean to you? Well, one, I invite you to come to any and all meetings you want to. That if you go to the Senate website, the listing of when our meetings are is posted there. There's only one meeting in the year that's elected senators only. Otherwise, any faculty member is more than welcome to come to any Senate meeting and be part of that meeting. So we would welcome you to be there. Check the website. Look and see what the charges were last year, what was accomplished, what we're looking forward to uh, for the coming year. As I mentioned, follow your emails. Check the MyVU and the MyVUMC um, emails that you get to find out what the Senate is doing. And then talk to us. Uh, my door is always open, my email is always open, my phone is ready and available. If you have issues that you want me to address or bring to the executive committee, or you want to contact your own senator within your school, please do that. We want to make sure your issues are being addressed. And finally, anchor down, and that doesn't just mean support the football team, that means to come together as a faculty to help move us forward. I think to me that's what anchor down really means, is coming together to accomplish a goal together. So that is it for me. I would like to now introduce and bring forward the chancellor of our great university, Chancellor Nick Zeppos, to move forward with the awards part. Well, it's great to be here and to see so many friends as we begin the year. And uh, Donald, thank you for your very, very uh, uh, warm, Welcome and for your amazing leadership. Uh, I think that you and the Senate and particularly your executive committee are great partners in moving the university forward. Uh, I also want to thank my great friend Greg Bars for a really interesting and challenging presentation. Uh, I think uh, Greg represents the best in so many ways and I'm particularly proud that Vanderbilt continues to look at and to think about and to study health care and health policy and global health from so many different perspectives. Only if we uh, really widen our lens intellectually and ethically can we really begin to solve many of the challenges that we face. Uh, now, I'm very, very excited to be here. And as uh, Donald said, we rarely get together as a faculty community. And I really enjoy these not for the ceremony, uh, as much as for the sense of community and the sense of continuity that the faculty and only the faculty can bring to a university. And I also think it's very important for us to come together to uh, get a, my report on the university, but more importantly, to celebrate each other, to uh, uh, say thank you, to really uh, recognize the devotion each of us has to serving the university in remarkable ways. Uh, I think as faculty, 
And as Greg's work shows, we have a, very, a great responsibility to make an impact on individuals, but on society more broadly. I think that's why we come here every day. And our work is increasingly of importance. It's interdisciplinary in character. And so let's go forward with a great year, but recognizing the power of what each of us does. So uh, the first order of business is for me to preside over our awards. And uh, I'm going to ask Donald, as we ritually do, to return uh, to the stage to give the awards away with me. Uh, with me. First, uh, we pay tribute to the faculty who have dedicated 25 years of service to Vanderbilt. The presentation of the Chancellor's Awards for Research will follow that. And then, of course, we recognize distinguished service to the university with our Thomas Jefferson Award, and then uh, our Outstanding Achievement in Research Award, the Earl Sutherland Prize. I remember the uh, Quarter Century Club, and so I take special pride in recognizing and welcoming the faculty who have devoted 25 years of service to this great university. Each name that I call today will receive a chair bearing the Vanderbilt University symbol and a brass plate engraved with the individual faculty member's name. My chair, which is a rocking chair, uh, sits uh, across from my desk and uh, is a, a welcome place for people who come to see me and sometimes ask for a building. I know that you all share <laughs> I know that you all share my enthusiasm in recognizing these friends of ours, these colleagues of our, ours, these distinguished members of the Vanderbilt family. I only ask, and I know it's hard, because we uh, love these people, but we have a, a, a large number to recognize. So if possible, please hold your applause until the names have been called. Faculty, we're going to do it, but please join me on this stage. I think we'll all fit as you hear your name and remain on stage so we can have a great group photo on this wonderful occasion. So, from the Blair School, Michael H. Keurig. From the College of Arts and Science, Randolph Blake, Charles A. Brow, J. Clayton, John H. English, Anthony B. Mello, Larry L. Shoemaker, Virginia M. Scott. From the Divinity School, our good friend and colleague, Forrest E. Harris, Sr. From the School of Engineering, Amruter Anil Kumar, Gautam Bizwa. Benoit Dewant, Gabor Karsai, Sankaran Mahavadan, Richard Allen Peters II, Julie E. Sharp. I'm going to have to do this. Come on, Mike. Great to see you. From the School of Medicine, Rasul Abdul, Abdul Solnia, Basil Abu Khalil. Please come across. I'll make room here. Ellen Wright Clayton, Marta Hernandez Schulman, Jeremy J. Tate. Jeremy is one of the most distinguished photographers on the campus. <laughs> Christopher D. Lynn. Richard M. O'Brien. Alvin C. Powers. William R. Riddle. Charles B. Rush. Boy, this is, this is a big class. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald Schumann. Donna L. Seeger, Gregory C. Seffert, Virginia L. Shepard, George P. Strickland, Cindy L. Bonacek Jones. Now, I have a number of faculty members.
partners who could not be with us today. And I would also like to recognize them for their 25 years of great service. They are uh, Carlos L. Artiega, Wing Fu Kang, and Laura R. Nover. You have from Peabody, Aline H. Harris. You get a sofa. Craig <laughs> <laughs> A. Smith. Okay. Try that again. Lori? <laughs> Come on up. Now again, my hearty congratulations and my deepest thanks to all of these distinguished members of our academic community who are uh, uh, tireless in what I think cumulatively is almost a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> a thousand years of teaching, of discovery, of caring for people. What better symbol, what better reality of all of the great things we do at Vanderbilt. Congratulations. President. <laughs> It's now time to present the Chancellor's Award for Research, which recognize excellence in research, scholarship, or creative expression. These awards are given for works presented or published in the preceding three calendar years. Each of these five awards carries a stipend of $1,000, and the recipient receives an engraved pewter julep cup. Donald, are you up here to assist me in the presentation of these awards? If you hear your name announced as an award winner, stand, make your way to the stage as I share the audience with the audience a short summary of the significance of your research that contributed to your selection for this great prize. The first Chancellor's Award goes to Randy Blakely, a Professor of Pharmacology, and Jeremy Veenstra Vanderweel, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, for their outstanding article. Come on, Randy, let's get up here. Is Jeremy here too? Come on, Jeremy. For their outstanding article, Autism Gene Variant Causes Hyperserotonemia, Serotonin Receptor Hypersensitivity, Social Impairment, and Repetitive Behavior. A full one-third of patients with autism have elevated levels of the neurotransmitter serotonin in the blood. However, prior to Randy and Jeremy's findings, the relationship of this observation to the condition was really not known. 
Their research found that mice engineered to express a variant of the serotonin transporter were found to demonstrate elevated levels of serotonin in the blood and to display behavioral traits associated with autism. Randy and Jeremy's observations closes a key causal link between serotonin levels in autistic behavior. Their brilliant observation suggests obvious diagnostic and therapeutic approaches for this debilitating condition as the relationship between serotonin levels and the mechanism of brain dysfunction is explored. Collaborations of this caliber are becoming increasingly important in analyzing and addressing the complex problems in biology that must be solved in order to truly affect the treatment of human disease. And this prize defines Vanderbilt's role as a 21st century research university that is attracting the best collaborative minds to study and work here. For the distinction they bring to Vanderbilt, for the promise their great research brings to those affected by autism, I am extremely pleased and present this award to this dynamic duo. Randy, Jeremy, my congratulations. Oh, I'm not going to be asked back. They're going to Billy Crystal. <laughs> Thank you. The next Chancellor's Award for Research goes to Vivian Casagranda, Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology for her publication of a groundbreaking paper in Nature Neuroscience. Vivian's discovery identifying a novel linkage between previously dismissed areas of the visual cortex in the thalamus, which controls the ability of the visual system to focus, shows that, even, that when this specific region of the thalamus is shut off, shut off, it blocks the visual cortex from responding to stimulation. The seminal nature of this publication has been noted by her professional colleagues as a, quote, truly pivotal finding, unquote, and as, quote, one of the most important discoveries of the organization of the central visual pathway in years, unquote, with the prediction that it will be seen in due course as a true classic. Vivian is highly regarded as an outstanding scientist, internationally renowned for her contributions to evolutionary, developmental, and sensory systems neuroscience. The result of her work is expected to have a significant effect on our view of the ways that visual and likely other sensory information is gated by subcortical structures. I am delighted to present this Chancellor's Award in recognition of Vivian's outstanding contributions as a luminary scientist and scholarly leader. Congratulations, Vivian. I'm delighted to present the next Chancellor's Research Award to Betsy Robinson, Associate Professor of History of Art for her monograph, Histories of Pyrene, a Corinthian Fountain in Three Millennia. Betsy, come on forward. <laughs> praised, praised, Praised as a singular achievement of cross-disciplinary research, Histories of Pyrene represents a remarkable study of a historic site known in Greek mythology as the place where Bellerophon tamed the winged horse, Pegasus. Betsy combined precise archaeological and archival research and drawings that illustrate the development of the site with a beautiful narrative, a beautiful narrative to illustrate the story with a sense of human interaction with the fountain. Her groundbreaking quality of work 
and methodological approach made this monograph worthy of inclusion in the prestigious series Ancient Art and Architecture in Context Monographs, published by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens, destined to become the model for archaeological and visual culture studies to follow, Betsy's absolute masterpiece is also most deserving of the Chancellor's Award for Research. Betsy, please accept this award along with my hearty congratulations. Great work. The fourth Chancellor's Research Award goes to Dayu Lee, Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering for his research discovery to control heat flow, published in the paper, Enhanced and Switchable Nanoscale Thermal Conduction Due to Van der Waals Interfaces. Congratulations, Dayu. <laughs> now, Getting published in Nature Nanotechnology with its acceptance rate, I'm told, of about 1% is a feat unto itself. Deyu, along with two of his graduate students, described their groundbreaking scientific discovery of unexpected energy carrier transmission through Van der Waals interfaces between individual nanostructures, which leads to new power of manipulating materials thermal transport capabilities. These remarkable findings upend the classical view of energy transport through solid interfaces. This holds remarkable promise for new solutions to the current bottleneck in nano-electronic devices. As most failure of modern computers is due to thermal damage of electronic components, effective manipulation of the dissipated heat Dissipated heat plays an extremely important role. Deu's research represents a significant breakthrough discovery in keeping computer chips cool and operating in a safe temperature range. Additionally, this new understanding will help solve many pop problems and puzzles in energy transport through composite materials with many interfaces and could lead to more advanced design rules for applications in aerospace, flexible electronics, and energy conversion. For this brilliant discovery, which includes mentoring two very bright graduate students, I am pleased to bestow on Deyu this award. Congratulations, great work. Today's final Chancellor's Award for Research goes to Daniel J. Sharfstein for his impeccably brilliantly researched book, The Invisible Line, Three American Families and the Secret Journey from Black to White. Daniel? He even came, he has a Guggenheim this year. So nice of him. You have to read this book. It's unbelievable. Tracing the thread through multi-generational stories of three African-American families, Dan chronicles their lives through the divergent points in American history in which they lived. Pre-revolutionary, pre-Civil War, and Jim Crow era. He paints a vivid picture of three distinct areas of the South that each family called home and he examines their socioeconomic positions to reveal the very complicated role of racial identity. Through this brilliant amalgamation of prose and research, Dan allows the reader to peer through each family's history, lens-like, to grasp the role of law in creating and defining racial categories, racial ideologies, racial boundaries and hierarchies in the United States. Among the honors and recognitions the Invisible Line has received are the Anthony J. Lucas Book Prize, 
the James Willard Hearst Prize. Thrilled to see that. He was my professor. And the Chicago Tribune's favorite books of 2011. Daniel is a prolific writer. He's an incredible scholar. He's a brilliant mind and a great teacher an immensely talented researcher. He's, as I said, a Guggenheim Fellow, and he's an important voice in examining law and its application and effect on our society and various segments of our society. It is my honor to present him with this Chancellor's Award. Congratulations, Dan. It's now time to present the Thomas Jefferson Award. This award is made annually for distinguished service to Vanderbilt through extraordinary contributions as a member of the faculty in the councils and in the governance of the university. It carries with it an engraved pewter goblet and a $2,500 prize. I am very pleased to say that this year's recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Award is Gordon Bernard. Gordon, will you please come forward? Now, Gordon serves Vanderbilt in many important roles in sensitive positions, including Associate Vice Chancellor for Clinical and Translational Research, Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Sciences, and as the Melinda Owen Bass Chair in Medicine. Gordon works extremely hard to further our mission to obtain grant funding to support the vital research that defines Vanderbilt's position as one of our nation's top institution of research. Among his most significant accomplishments is clinching a $50 million Clinical and Translational Science Award from the National Institute of Health. Recognizing his exemplary leadership, CTSA appointed him as the director of the CTSA Coordinating Center, which oversees approximately 60 CTSA awards nationwide at our top universities and medical centers. Thanks to this significant funding that Gordon has secured, Vanderbilt, our Vanderbilt, has now become an international leader in so many areas, bioinformatics, which has parlayed into our strength, our visibility, our hope in personalized medicine. Projects that have benefited from Gordon's determined efforts and allow a vast range of data be translated into research finding and discoveries of new personalized medical treatments based on individual genetics include REDCap, a database system that is HIPAA protected, BioView, one of the world's largest human DNA data banks, and the synthetic derivative, a unique HIPAA-approved de-identified medical record. Gordon is focused on advancing research capabilities both by providing new tools as well as by reducing the barriers that impede research discovery and care. Indeed, he has helped catapult Vanderbilt to the cutting edge the cutting edge as a pioneer in combining disciplinary strengths such as genetics, genome science, and clinical pharmacology. He has played a crucial role in laying the foundation for the Vanderbilt Initiative for Surgery and Engineering, which represents a model for collaboration and innovation, bringing together the talents and skills of the Medical Center and the School of Engineering. Gordon's committed to service to Vanderbilt is truly extraordinary, and his contributions promote a progressive research environment where physicians and nurses and research scientists are working together to find medical devices and regimens to address and manage the most complex health challenges that afflict humankind. With deep appreciation and respect, I am pleased to present Gordon with the Thomas Jefferson Award. Congratulations, Gordon.
Today's final award is the Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement in Research, known as the Nobel Prize of Vanderbilt. I've now referred to the Nobel as the Sutherland of Sweden. <laughs> this is the most prestigious honor that Vanderbilt bestows on a faculty member in recognition of accomplishments in research, scholarship, or creative expression presented annually to a member of the Vanderbilt faculty whose achievements in research, scholarship, or creative expression have received significant critical acclaim and are recognized at the highest levels, nationally or internationally. This prize consists of a $5,000 gift and an engraved pewter julep cup. The winner's name is added to a silver bowl that the recipient keeps for one year. Today, I take great delight in awarding the prestigious Sutherland Prize to our colleague and good friend, John Gore, University Professor of Radiology. <laughs> University Professor of Radiology and Radiological Sciences in the Hertha Ramsey Crest Chair in Medicine. John's pioneering scholarship in the field of magnetic resonance imaging and research has transformed Vanderbilt in numerous and important ways. His work has laid a strong, enduring foundation for the Vanderbilt University Institute of Imaging Science. He actually got a building, which is, nat <laughs> which is nationally recognized as a highly successful research enterprise. Because of John's brilliance, his leadership, his determination, Vanderbilt is the host to the research conference, the frontiers of biomedical imaging science. This puts us at the very epicenter for bringing together researchers from various subfields across numerous disciplines of imaging sciences to review state-of-the-art and burgeoning breakthroughs. His record of scholarship is simply extraordinary. Since joining the university in 2002, he has solely or jointly authored 270 archival scientific publication. That's an incredible average of 27 papers per year over the last decade. I would be remiss, however, if I did not mention John's innovative methods in neuroimaging at high field strengths that have enabled groundbreaking approaches to identifying tumor tissues and their very early responses to therapies. The potential clinical Im impact of advanced MRI for oncology applications holds tremendous promise for improving outcomes and quality of life for patients dealing with the debil debilitating effects of, of cancer. It gives me great pride, it gives me great pride and joy to recognize John's incredibly valuable contributions to Vanderbilt, his transformation of science, and his practice of medical imaging by bestowing on him the Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement in Research. John, please accept from me and our whole university community this award with our congratulations and gratitude. Well, I think the plane is on time, and I'll try to get us ahead of schedule so that we can adjourn and enjoy each other's company in the Board of Trust Room. But I have the privilege of advising you on the state of the university. Now, a number of words come to my mind as I advise you about the state of the university. Strong, ascendant, enduring, exciting, innovative, optimistic, transformative. Now these stand in marked contrast to the larger political and economic environment in which we operate and how we would describe them. Stagnated, pessimistic, divisive, gridlock, superficial. It is simply a miracle of human ingenuity and through the blessings of freedom 
that the medieval university has grown into the great modern private research university. I am pleased to say that Vanderbilt continues to ascend to the very first rank among these greatest of American institutions. We begin this year as a university with increased academic distinction, more intellectual achievements, and greater recognition for just doing good. We had a record year in our undergraduate applications. We had the lowest admission rate for both undergraduates and graduate students in our recorded history. We collected dozens and dozens of prestigious faculty awards. We had a new high in our philanthropy. We increased our research funding against all odds. And we did a record amount of uncompensated care for those most in need. These laurels all follow, they all follow from the strength of our academic community and the values, those values of civility and collegiality we so cherish. They also follow, most importantly, directly from your leadership, the faculty who dedicate your lives to our mission, working tirelessly with great passion to change the world, always for the better. You have my admiration and my deep appreciation. Your devotion and commitment to our mission are particularly important because of the exceptional challenges we continue to face. The federal sequester has chopped significant funds from research, the very lifeblood of American innovation and entrepreneurship. The sequester has also cut Medicare when more than one-fourth of our healthcare patients pay through this shrinking pool of revenue. Uncertainty over federal budgets and the debt ceiling fight continues to occur, and it's leading all institutions to exercise great caution. These fiscal policies are unfortunately not matched by a forbearance from a never-ending appetite at all levels of government to impose upon universities even greater, even greater and invasive regulatory burdens. Hundreds of thousands of pages of new rules, regulations, hearings called, policy statements, letters of advice, and other sources of guidance are issued each year. The indifference exhibited by our government leaders to the impact of these policies on the cost of education and research is simply alarming. The many distinctive qualities of Vanderbilt do provide us with special opportunities to discover, to lead, and to teach. One that truly sets us apart from many of our peers is the presence on our campus and full ownership of our world-class hospitals and clinics. Our one Vanderbilt strategy presents numerous opportunities, as we have seen, for making scientific breakthroughs and devising dramatic improvements in care. It also provides rare opportunities for our undergraduate students to engage in research and discovery and to interact with a world-class medical and nursing faculty and healthcare staff. At the same time, this distinct part of our one Vanderbilt strategy makes us much more vulnerable to the current significant challenges in healthcare. We are now enduring what historically is the most significant shift in healthcare since the establishment of Medicare in 1965 and the contemporaneous techni technological revolution in care. As federal budget pressures are forcing reductions in Medicare reimbursements, our patient population continues to age, meaning that more and more of those for whom we care will be on Medicare that will pay lower reimbursement rates. Added to this is the continued doubt over the extension of Medicaid in Tennessee. We provide more than one third of the free indigent care in middle Tennessee. Finally, we are seeing private insurance reducing what they will pay for healthcare services. For decades, the American healthcare system has managed to muddle along by shifting to those who pay through private insurance the ballooning cost of caring for the indigent, the uninsured, and the underinsured. Painfully, Spurred by the economic contraction of the Great Recession, employers have cut this cost of doing business, which had been growing at more than double the rate of inflation. Through this combination of forces, it is no surprise the system is now showing strain on all fronts. It's not hard to understand, therefore, why we're going through these throes of change. 
Bear in mind that health care costs add up to almost 20% of our GDP, a percentage that far exceeds that of any developed nations, which, by the way, have better, better health care outcomes. With this rapid transformation, we have had to move quickly to adapt, and it is not without great challenge and pain. As we move forward, we must focus, we must focus, as we always do, on who we are and what we do as an academic institution, as an academic medical center that trains physician and nursing leaders, physician and nursing scientists, and that makes breakthroughs in care. The future of American healthcare will be driven by great doctors and nurses who are increasingly reliant on information technology that drives quality, consistency, efficiency, and improves outcomes. Vanderbilt is a global leader in all these fields, and we are fortunate to have Vice Chancellor Jeff Balzer and his outstanding team leading us through this time of disruptive change. Yes, the broader environment is extremely challenging. For me, it's sometimes nerve-wracking, sleep-depriving. However, we can meet these uncertainties with better ideas, with better solutions. We must never, we must never allow these external challenges, our challenges, and the time we are gifted to steward Vanderbilt to in any way limit our aspirations and alter our timeless mission. As a great private university, we have the freedom and the responsibility to define who we are, what we do, and to articulate creative and innovative ways that shape our teaching, care, and discovery. It is for this reason that in the spring, I announced the commencement of a strategic planning process. I asked us <clears throat> at that time to focus on four areas. Four areas of major public discourse. Four areas of significance, of great potential for Vanderbilt. First, we must define the 21st, for the 21st century, the undergraduate experience in the residential university. Second, we must identify those areas of greatest promise for new trans-institutional programs and funding of existing areas where Vanderbilt can be best in class and make world-changing differences. Third, we must develop, research, and test the educational potential, the potential and the peril of new technologies and social media and intensely study their broader impact on society and the individual. Fourth, we must harness all of our considerable expertise in full display today, our disciplinary breadth, our passion to develop a healthcare system that is fair, effective, efficient, and transparent. Shortly after commencement, I appointed John Gear, Gertrude Conaway, Vanderbilt Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Political Science Department. I know John is here. John? Yeah, stand up so we... Okay, many of you know John. And Susan Wente, Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology and Associate Vice Chancellor for Research to co-chair this strategic planning effort. I am grateful to them. It will be the first effort ever in Vanderbilt's history where the schools of medicine and nursing are full partners along with all of the other colleges and schools of Vanderbilt to participate in a strategic plan for our university. When I charged John and Susan to lead this effort, I gave them four principles to guide this process. First, the process must be faculty-led and faculty-driven. Second, the process must be broadly inclusive and transparent. Third, the process must be bold. It must be ambitious. Fourth, the outcome must be the draft blueprint for our future significant transformative investments and in our next capital campaign. With guidance from John and Susan, I appointed an executive committee of 25 faculty members from across the university. We have now appointed a total of over 160 faculty from across the university to 
serve on study groups, and participate in a series of day-long conversations on these four areas and other areas of importance. We actually began our discussions this summer, and these exchanges have been provocative, absolutely brilliant, enlightening, and quite spirited. We have gone deeply, deeply into question of mission and values and the unique qualities and potential of Vanderbilt. We have gone back to first principles to ask, what are the qualities we want our students to carry with them for life? What are the most fundamental global and societal problems and challenges that Vanderbilt can address and hopes help to solve? How do the values and mission of a college experience for undergraduates become fully realized and furthered in a research university setting? Can healthcare be provided more cheaply and effectively and more broadly? Are new technologies an end? Are they an end or are they rather a means to carry out our historic mission? Should every graduate leave with a capstone experience? Should every graduate leave with a capstone experience? Growing out of research, discovery, innovation. What are the new majors? What are the new PhD programs of the future? The answer to these questions will not be clear, nor will they be easy to find. But it is our opportunity, indeed our obligation, to pose them and to answer them through a broad, broad faculty dialogue. I am confident that our discussions will reveal, reveal to us the many, many ways in which we can all make Vanderbilt greater in our time. Let me close by recounting to you what I told our students gathered on Alumni Lawn last Sunday evening after their joyous brass band resounding Founders Walk. I looked out on the faces of hundreds of global citizens a sea of diversity, bright, new, nervous, anxious, but hopeful young people with so much potential. And they're left in our care by those who love them dearly. The sun was setting, pinking the clouds, and I could see the heights of our collegiate buildings, new and old, peeking over the tops of our magnificent trees. We are a great university, I told the class of 2017, because of our people. We live and learn together inside hospitals, classrooms, research laboratories, and outside of them. We believe in friendship, inclusion, community, and civility. Knowledge inspires passion, but not destruction or falsehoods. We care deeply about each other, and we never harm each other or allow others to do harm. I told them you are now part of every good we will strive to accomplish here. As professors, you know in everything you do that each of us as part of Vanderbilt is capable of so much good. Collectively though, collectively we the faculty we're so much stronger. We're that much better able to do real good. And nobody, nobody who takes a step on this campus is more important in shaping our values, our culture, and shaping and fulfilling our mission than you, the faculty. I feel privileged every day as I begin my 27th year to be your colleague on the faculty and privileged to be your chancellor. Thank you for all you do for Vanderbilt, for all you will continue to do. And welcome back. We're gonna have a great year. Thank you. Please join me in the Board of Trust Room for a reception.